welcome back, everyone. So I, I had a little bit of extra time. I was supposed to have a meeting today with a social worker, a job coach, and um, that ended up not happening. So I have some extra time to record a video. And um, well, I realized I didn't have to set up a bunch of things, which I normally do. So nothing fancy, but you know, at least I get to make a video and talk to y'all. That's that's better than not reaching out and talking to anyone at all. So nothing fancy, but you know, it'll get the job done. Um, so, what's the thing with this camera? It's mirror. That's not my right hand. That's my left hand. It's a mirror. Um, so recently, I, I made a post that um, I, I talked about this on on Facebook. I can bring that up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's see, what was it? It was, I, I posted it on, on Twitter as well. I said, in your opinion, why is it before the 1920s when no drugs had been made illegal yet sold over the counter with no RX or prescription, we did not have an epidemic of overdoses, addiction, or the stigmatization of recreational users we see today. And man, that pissed a lot of people off. <laughs> so, um... Like, like on Facebook, it pissed a lot of people off. Not not so much on disability Twitter. Disability Twitter was basically like, yeah. So there was this Smithsonian article that was given to me, and I'm not going to read through all of it because uh, it's long. I've read through all of it already. Um, I, I suppose I can leave the link in the description so you can read through it if you want. But one of the problems is, is that um, it doesn't talk about anyone overdosing. It just talks about addiction. And guess what the two major constituents of people who were, you know, users, recreational users of um, this drug. What, what happened was is there was an overprescribing. Um, you know, it's a fairly powerful painkiller. I mean, you know, if, if your alternatives back in the 1800s, if they were to do that today, you'd, you'd, you'd scream and run and try to sue the doctor for malpractice. I mean, they give you some whiskey or some kind of alcohol and tell you to bite down on a stick and good luck. So, you know, the advent of things like Morphine, hydromorphine, intravenous morphine was probably a miracle back then, you know, and they threw it at a lot of pain things like we've done even today. I think, to me, the, the real problem is this, is prescribing the opiates to acute pain. I don't think the problem is, is so much with chronic pain, which is for life. I think the problem is acute, because with acute pain, uh, a lot of the times these are outpatient procedures if a surgery is even required. And then they get exposed to an opiate that they otherwise normally wouldn't, unless they're, you know... A street angel, a trash angel, gutter punk person like myself, um, they probably would never have been exposed to opiates at all. And so then they get exposed to it and they go, oh wow, and they seek it out, blah blah blah, and then they blame pain meds, etc, etc. But when you're a chronic pain patient, well, it's a little bit different. But the thing that this article doesn't, they, they kind of brush on it actually, they almost say it without saying it, and I don't know that the author really realized this, but when you read through it, it sort of talks about, well, the reason why opiates were getting banned... Oh, well, hold on, I'm getting ahead. I'm getting ahead. Hold on, sorry. That brain fog. I only slept like four hours last night, so forgive me. Um, so anyway, so this supposed overprescribing occurred, and a lot of it was being given, you know, again, just talked about acute pain. Well, they would prescribe this for things like menstrual cramps, headaches, you know, things, things that they, they had alternatives for that they didn't need to prescribe opiates for. They were prescribing opiates for it, and Honestly, they didn't even need to prescribe it because you could buy it over the counter. It was pretty accessible back then. It wasn't, it wasn't illegal. It wasn't made illegal until the 1920s. But they started noticing, you know, this, this spike in sort of addiction and, um, what was it, the Civil War? They, they used it a lot, which makes sense, especially the lack of medical ingenuity we had back then. That makes a lot of sense to use opiates when you have people missing limbs and having nerve damage and whatnot. Uh, not a lot of things touch nerve damage. Not a lot of things touch nerve pain. We have anti-inflammatories and muscle relaxers. They don't really touch nerve pain. Alcohol does, and opiates do. That's about it. So, a bunch of war vets, you know, they, they got totally addicted. But the concern came in that all these housewives started to become addicted. Now, this is where you start to see the misogyny up here. And something else happened, too. That was sort of a, an act of racism. So, they started creating regulations, making it so the physicians wouldn't prescribe the opiate all willy-nilly you know I mean, we're not talking about just opium like resin or opium poppies we're talking like laudanum which is hardcore that's like morphine coating and alcohol which they no longer make that's that's a hardcore thing um 
and, and then of course, you know, more morphine and codeine. So this is what they were prescribing to these people. So they started making regulations that, you know, you needed to prescribe it for, you know, a necessary medical purpose. And so a lot of people were taken off. Well, being that they had tried this, they liked it, they became addicted, whether that be something that you would call OUD or SUD. For those of you who don't know, that stands for opiate use disorder or substance use disorder. Addiction by today's standards is being defined as that of what you would see in the DSM, is that in order for it to be classified as an addiction and not a chemical dependency, they make a differentiation between these two now, is that addiction is that it starts to impair one's ability to function properly within their life. So, <clears throat> you know, they're putting the use of the drug before their own well-being, like having a roof over their head, food to eat, getting bills paid, um, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that's the definition they, and, and that's the definition they use for disorder in the DSM. Like a lot of people have obsessive compulsive tendencies and they might even say they have OCD, but in order to have actual, the disorder of obsessive compulsion, it has to impair your ability to function normally. Like if you have OCD to the point where you can't leave your house, that's the disorder. You know, if you're just very particular about how your silverware is organized, that's not a disorder. It's not disrupting your, your normal function of life. So addiction is being defined as disrupting your ability to function in life. And then chemical dependency is where, you know, if you stop taking it, you have a withdrawal, but you're not letting the substance control your life. Okay, so that's the definitions that we're running with. And this is where the OUD and SUD come from. Substance use disorder, opiate use disorder, referring to particular addiction to particular substance or just, you know, SUD. Anyway, um, where was I? So what these people did back in the 1800s is after they started putting the regulations in, lo and behold, what we see time and time again when the government lays down the gauntlet of authoritarianism, uh, people started, well, they turned to an alternative that wasn't necessarily illegal at the time, which was smoking opium resin and opium poppies. Well, one of the things that Asian immigrants were doing, particularly from China, they were coming over here to the United States and opening up opium dens. It's part of the American dream. Come over here, start your own business, be your own self-made person. And so uh, a lot of this was a, a lot of people who use these opium dens that the Chinese people, immigrants were coming over here and opening up um, <clears throat> were people that had very physically demanding jobs and a lot of physical damage to their body due to the physically demanding jobs that they had. And because, you know, they couldn't get access to opiate pain meds from the doctors due to the restrictions and regulations. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, that's actually happening today. Um, so they, they would go to these uh, opium dens and smoke opium poppies and their, um, opium resin, which is less potent, less addictive, less harmful. Well, then you had all these housewives and all these Chinese people profiting off of, you know, very well astute uh, you know, men of physical labor. But their, their biggest focus in the article was the fact that housewives were using this and that it was opium dens being opened by Asian immigrants, particularly those from China. That's when they decided to make it illegal in the 1920s, especially uh, when prostitutes started using it. So... It has its roots. It's it's being made illegal. Its roots are based in misogyny and racism. The article doesn't outright say that, but it's pretty evident that's what it was. It was, you know, we, we want our, our women to be untainted. We don't want them to be mentally compromised because then they might sleep with, um, you know, um, somebody we don't want them to, like a black person or an Asian person or a Hispanic person. You know, we don't want that. Um, or, you know, like, businessmen who make lots of money who engage in prostitutes, they um, they wanted to make sure that, you know, their prostitutes were in good condition because we don't want the wives finding out and we don't want people to think that, you know, you know it, it, it just reeks of misogyny and, and racism towards Asian people. It reeks of it. But throughout the entire article, they didn't talk about overdoses. It was predominantly about addiction. Addiction itself, which addiction back then was defined differently than we do today. Addiction back then is just simply referring to what we refer to as OUD or SUD. But it also, at the same time, referred to chemical dependency, both. They did not make that distinction back then. The article doesn't discuss this. But, you know, a lot of people don't realize that when I advocate for this kind of stuff, it's like, you know, like, I, I think it's interesting that all these, these leftists, um, especially anyone that calls himself an anarchist, comes forward and, and says, um, you know, this stuff should be banned, it should be illegal. It's like, really, you're advocating for criminality. Advocating for criminality, that's interesting. I don't. Um, I, I, I think that's a violation of human rights and, and dignity. I, I, I think there's some bodily autonomy that's being ignored there. Um, you know, I, I kind of run with the philosophy, do what you love, love you, what, what you do. Um, and if you're ashamed of what you're doing, you probably shouldn't be doing it. Uh, for instance, you know, I mean, if 
whatever your vice is, if you're doing it in excess and you don't like the outcomes of that, then yeah, I would absolutely encourage you to, to get clean, get sober, quit, do whatever it is you have to do to stop that vice. If um, you're, you're starting to do things you don't want to do or you're in a place where you're not ultimately happy, yeah, get clean, stop doing it. But there are people out there who have a vice and they've been doing it for many, 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 many years. And they're completely content. They're in, in fact, it's what makes them content in life. And who am I to judge or take that away from them? You know, as long as I, I, I really, I think you should be able to do whatever you want as long as you're not hurting anybody else. I really have only five things that I'm tr but pretty adamantly against is murder, rape, child molestation, molestation period, and abuse, you know, physical violence against that. And um, then theft, but theft is like way down here, sort of in a different category. To me, it's it's like, you know, the misdemeanor. The rest are, you know, felonies. It's like, okay, we need to keep, you know, the first four I mentioned away from the general public because they are a danger to others. And But theft, it's like, eh, well, you know, we can we can move past that, but you shouldn't do that. Uh, I, I'm not of the mindset of communists of no such thing as private property. It's like, well, obviously, you've never had, like, sentimental attachment to anything, have you? I mean, you know, like, I have a backpack in my closet that's, I mean, I suppose it could be worth some money because it's, um, you know, uh, it's it's not designer, but, you know, it's it's... It's handmade. It's not something you can just find anywhere. And, uh, well, the thing is, is it belongs to my dead brother. And I don't have a lot of things of his left. Because when he died, he rotted in his apartment for seven days. In 80 degree weather, on the top floor of a four-story apartment. With the presence of blowflies. So, a lot of stuff in that apartment got thrown away because, uh, once that smell, uh, it's very unique, very unforgettable smell. It gets embedded into things. You can't get it out. It's, it's impossible. You can't. So uh, the, the backpack happened to be at a friend of his, at a, one of his friend's house. And um, so it didn't have this. And, you know, maybe maybe that backpack has some kind of monetary value of some kind of somebody that somebody might try to exchange for. Um, maybe the mentality of, you know, like, there's no such thing as private property. But, well, it's like, that's, you don't understand the sentimentality behind it. That's the only belonging left i have of this so has a very very different meaning to me there's not enough money you could give me for that backpack there's there's nothing you could give me in exchange for it that would make up that what it what it is to me it's very different so no i i don't uh, don't follow that communist nonsense of no private property no no we, we have private property we do there are things that are mine and um, i would appreciate uh, people not taking them so uh I think communalism is something that comes with permission, and there are things that we can be communal about, but not everything. So uh, that, that's something that's actually different between the philosophy of anarchism and communism. Is anarchists follow a philosophy called cooperative survival. Don't run with this whole anti-Darwinianism of life do doesn't compete for resources. It's like, really? Are you sure? I'm pretty sure life competes for resources. I, I don't I don't know that you could make that argument anywhere in nature that life does not compete for resources. That's about the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. But what we do know, well, there are some species that do participate in cooperative survival. And we're one of them. So um, that's actually, believe it or not, that's one of the philosophical differences between communism and anarchism. Um, but um, another philosophical difference is um, dictatorial rule. Uh, well, I, I find it fascinating when an anarchist says that, yeah, these things should be illegal, and, and they're enforcing the idea of communality for substance use. Why? That's that's authoritarian. You know, at that point, to me, from my perspective, maybe I'm just old school, I don't know, but from my perspective, you're just a Democrat. Democrats like to produce laws and rules and regulations and dip their toe on the left. And then, you know, the socialists, the, the Democrat, uh, social Democrats or Democratic socialists, they're kind of the bridge uh, between anarchism, the, the gateway between, or the, uh, yeah, the bridge between anarch anarchists and the anarchist left, the far um, anti-authoritarian left and the um, more uh, center sort of leftist Democrat. Um, but yeah, if you're if you're spouting that all this, like, if, if you're one of these people that's like, cigarettes should be illegal, but weed should be legal, for one, you're a hypocrite, and two, you're a Democrat. Yeah, you, you wear anarchist labels all you want, you're not an anarchist. It's not an anarchist way. You, know, you, you can you can remove the capitalism out if somebody wants to participate in the use of tobacco they should be able to participate in the use of tobacco it doesn't hurt anyone it hurts themselves maybe in the long run but a lot of things do that junk food sugar salt i mean 
being alive. Part of being alive is one day you're going to die. And, uh, you know, we, we kind of we have this birth and we have a death. And we should have the same in between to impact our quality of life and try to be as happy and content as we possibly can. And that's the goal. That's the idea, right? So I don't, I don't see an issue here. So maybe I'm just too anti-authoritarian, I would say anarchist. But, you know, a lot of these people claim to be the left. And it's like, well, I don't know. I thought predominantly the leftist position for a very, very long time was to be anti-prohibition. And now it's very prohibition, which is weird, because that's advocating for criminality, which is exploitative in, in, in general. Hmm. That sounds like a Democrat to me, a Democrat who's waving an anarchist or communist flag, going, look at me, look at me. Anarchism and, 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 and uh, communism is in vogue right now. I'm, I'm so anarchistic. Oh, should chronic pain patients have access to, um, to pain meds? No. Why? Well, because it's dangerous. I have heard the argument because it's wrong to profit off of addiction. I like that sentiment. I really do. I think it's probably, it probably is wrong to profitize off of addiction. But um, we're ignoring the fact that this has medical use at that point. You know, um, we, we, we wouldn't do this to diabetic patients and their insulin. We, we can't say, well, you know, people are using di diabetics needles to, to shoot up um, heroin. And now the heroin's being laced with fentanyl. And um, so we, we just, we can't offer insulin anymore sorry we, we have to we have to keep these people from overdosing we have to keep them from overdosing so we, we got to take the needles away and, and you know make it harder for them to use so that that, that we can get them to safety and get them clean and then stop the mass overdoses and everything so we have to take the needles and then all the people with diabetes are going like oh my god help me help me help me and the doctors will come forward and say well you know you just need to change your diet that's pretty much exactly what they've done to chronic pain patients like almost exactly like i've literally heard them say like oh the pain's all in your head you just have to deal with it I have atrophy. I literally have days where I struggle to pick up a PS4 controller. Just deal with it, huh? I think that's a lot easier said than done. And I think it's a lot easier said by somebody who's full able-bodied because you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. But I just, you know, I, you know maybe I'm just too anti-authoritarian, too anarchist, too anti-authoritarian. I don't know. You pick the word. Whatever whatever definition you run with, whatever that means. Um, I, I, don't, I don't like... Um, society or a government or something telling someone how they're supposed to live and what they can and cannot do with their own body. I, I think that's ridiculous. But, you know, I, I would also say that I think a lot of people, when they make these decisions to engage in vices, I'm getting kind of sick and tired of people not accepting the cause or the, the um, sacrifice that comes with it. It's another word. It's not cause or sacrifice, but the, um, the price, the... Uh, You, you, the, you know, the, there's something that comes with it. You know, like if, if you want to engage in in, um, in a ah, oh, what is the word? Fuck, 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 fuck. A nymphomaniac is the word that I was looking for, but apparently that word has changed to compulsive sexual behavior or hypersexuality disorder. Okay, whatever. Yay, uh, political correctness and, and everything. But, um, yeah, so, like, like let, I mean, I, I don't have a problem with this, you know. Like, if, if, let's say, your vice is sex and you want to take 500 dicks in your anus or in your vagina, that, that, that's cool. That's up to you. Um, but, you know, the, these, these people, some of these people that go into this vice or into a vice like that, let's say, and they get an STD, like, the, the true ones, I think, don't care. They go into it knowing that is a possibility. It's the ones that go into it and get like thinking that it's cool, but they don't want to accept or, or take into responsibility the consequences of their, the consequences is what's being ignored. And that's annoying the hell out of me because it's, it's like, look, you ought to know that if you're taking 500 penises in your anus or your vagina, whichever one it is for you, you're at a higher likelihood of contracting an STD or STI, whatever you want to call it. It's just, a higher likelihood of that. And I mean, you can call it, instead of STI, you can call it fluffy butterflies if you want. I, I don't think changing the name, it changes what it is. Um, most people don't want to get it. But, you know, these, these people who, who want, like, partnership or a romantic uh, love or something like that, 
might engage in the, this behavior and not realize, well, there's a consequence to that. And if you catch bu fluffy butterflies, or STIs, STDs, whatever you want to call them, um, that may diminish that, that possibility. That's a consequence of living that lifestyle. And what blows my mind is I refuse to believe that anyone is stupid enough not to know that if you take 500 dicks in your anus or your vagina a day, that your chances and probabilities of contracting fluffy butterflies, STIs, or STDs goes up. I refuse to believe anyone that's stupid. And so it's like, look, if you take on a vice like heroin, you have to do this with respect and knowing this is a highly addictive substance. This is a very addictive vice. It's got horrendous withdrawal effects. And... You know, there's, there's people out there that have been doing it for 40 years and they're completely content and happy doing it. And then there's people that go into it. They do it, they like it, they, they, they get hooked. And then they're like, well, I, I don't like the outcomes of this. And now I'm mad about it. How did you not know that? And I think it's because they go into it thinking they're invincible. They go, I'm too smart to become addicted. I've got everything under control. No, you don't. No, you don't. So this is this is what I mean. It's like I and then they try to project their experience onto everyone else. It put me in this situation. This situation was bad for me. It's not the situation I wanted to be in. Therefore, everyone else must obviously feel the same way when that's not the case. That's called being narcissistic, self-absorbed. Um, a lot of these people calling themselves punks, anarchist gods. To me, they sound like rich, suburbanite, suck-up, spoiled, middle-class brats. And they might as well be wearing Banana Republic or Abercrombie & Fitch. The, the level of moral busybody that goes into what they do, the, the self-absorbed position they have. Oh, I drank alcohol. My life spiraled out of control. I ended up having the shakes and the withdrawals. and and. I absolutely hated it. It almost destroyed my life. So therefore, alcohol should be illegal because no one else should be exposed to this and, and suffer the same as I did. Meanwhile, there's somebody who's an alcoholic that drinks every day and has been drinking a bottle from the time they wake up till the time they go to bed for their 40 years of the last 40 years of their life, and they're completely happy with it. They don't care. They want to die by it. And you, these people come in, these self-absorbed people come in, projecting their own experience onto this person that doesn't have the same experience, they're happy where they're at. They don't care. The only thing they care about is running out of alcohol and going to the shakes. They don't want to take it, take it away from them. They don't want to get clean. But this person will come in and say, well, you have to because it's, look at what it's doing to you. And they're like, what do you mean? What is it doing to me? I'm happy. This is what is not understood. That's one aspect of it. The other aspect is uh, not everyone goes through that. The, you know, there, there are people that do their vices very casually, and um, don't become enslaved to it. And so the presumption that everyone will, well, that's just not true. Not everyone who drinks alcohol becomes the, an alcoholic to the point where they have the shakes. Some people literally just consume it on a once-in-a-while basis. But see, the thing that bothers me is that these people, they'll, they'll go into a vice without, doing any, without any understanding, doing any research, or gaining any knowledge about the vice. And then when they experience a negative impact, they project that negative impact onto everyone else. And that's not everyone else's experience. And this is what happened when I made the Facebook post, is that I'm advocating, like, I, I would never suggest to somebody to go and use heroin. I would never do that. Just, just because I say that something should be legalized doesn't mean I think it should be popular. Absolutely not. I don't think heroin use should be popular at all. I just think criminalizing people who are addicted to heroin doesn't do them any good. In fact, it says a lot of danger. Putting them in prison or putting them in jail where they get clean, they get sober, their tolerance goes down. And then, see, the thing is, is people don't quit unless they want to. And they have to want to for themselves. You can't force them to. You can't guilt that trip them into that. You can't sit there and say, our family really wants you to get clean. They'll go through the motions. They go back to using one of the most dangerous things. And, and be even before they were putting fentanyl in it, was that they would send these heroin addicts to jail. They would get clean. They would get sober. They'd go through the withdrawals, all that. Their tolerance would go way down. And then when they got out... After being clean for so long, they go and they use again, and they use a dose they were familiar with. Well, the tolerance isn't as high, and they'd overdose, and they die. It's actually safer to let them continue to use and let them quit on their own terms. 
doesn't mean that I think it should be popular. And I do think that things like Narcan should be available, clean needles, clean water, all that stuff. And I think that having access to a safe supply where they know it's not going to be tainted with something like fentanyl or sleeping pills or something that could be very, very damaging and harmful to their body, I think that's the right direction to go. I think getting rid of the stigmatization is helpful for them, too. One of the reasons my brother didn't seek help when he overdosed, and he told me this before it happened, that if he ever did overdose, he would not seek medical attention at the ER. I said, why is that? He said, well, because even though they say that, that you're protected, you're not. They'll, you'll leave in, in cuffs. So if the stigmatization wasn't there, he probably would have gone to the ER. If the stigma, the reason why he didn't tell us that he fell off the wagon and started using again was because, well, he thought that we would be mad. I might have been disappointed, but I wouldn't have been mad. I would have preferred him be honest. I would have preferred him use in front of me. Because as long as he's not using alone, there's, especially with somebody like me that loves and cares about him the, the way that I do, I would rather have been there so that if he did overdose, I could have revived him. I am CPR trained. I could have revived him without taking him to the ER. I, this could have been done. This could have been done. But no. The way that society operates around it is, it's not how it works. And actually, it gets even darker, because if you help somebody who is overdosing, you could be arrested for sort of being an accomplice in the act. And that's fucked up. And honestly, a lot of the opiate medications that doctors use, um, I, I would like to see it where somebody who has addiction can go to a doctor and say, hey, I'm struggling with opiate addiction, with heroin addiction. I, I would like to get clean. A lot of the opiate medications we use have a shorter half-life than methadone or suboxone and are a much safer way of tapering someone off of heroin than methadone or suboxone. It's not, I'm not saying get rid of methadone or suboxone as, as you use. One of, the, one of the reasons they use it is it's an opiate agonist, and it makes it so that opiates don't work. So that is a viable option for a lot of people. I'm not saying take those off the table. I'm saying that the opiates that are in pain medications are significantly less potent and can be used to wean someone off of heroin. They can be used to counteract withdrawal symptoms. And doctors are trained to taper people off of things like opiates. Absolutely, they are. And I think it would be great if we could treat heroin addiction in such a manner that it is like a medical issue and let a doctor taper them off with opiates that are FDA approved. But that by no means means that I think it should be popular. So now that that's out of the way, let me explain. I'm advocating for chronic pain patients to have access to FDA approved opiate medications. That's what I'm advocating for. And that gets turned around into... I've had five friends overdose on fentanyl. Fuck you. Okay. I'm very, very sorry if you've had any loved ones overdose or die from fentanyl poisoning. That is truly tragic. If we want to talk about people profitizing off of addiction, the drug cartels are the worst. They don't just profitize off of addiction. The reason why the fentanyl is in there is because it's very addictive. And they put it in the drug to make it more addictive. So they have more return customers. No, they do this all the time. Drug drug dealers do this thing called creating an addict. They specifically target people. They give you strong stuff, get you addicted from the get-go, and make you a repeat customer all the time. Um, but when a person dies, they the drug dealer actually the, that had the customer who OD'd will see a spike in sales. Because all the hardcore addicts, the people who have been using for 40 years, you know, that person's got the good shit. I can spend less money and get just as high. That's the way they're looking at it. So you, you want to talk about the dark side of profitizing off of addiction? The drug cartels are not just profiting off of addiction. They're profiting off of death. Yeah. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm not necessarily advocating for all that. I'm advocating that, like, look, you know, when, when I'm vomiting stomach acid and blood, and a doctor pretty much looks at me and says, well, that's fine, as long as you're not on an opiate medication. I think we have a problem. You know, when, when epidurals and spinal stimulators are leaving people paralyzed and killing people, and you have non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and muscle relaxer pill cocktails that are sending people to the ICU and killing people, all just to avoid prescribing an opiate medication, I have to wonder about the rationale behind that. I, I have to ask him, well, I, I mean, this is just inhumane. When, when you're preferring essentially death just to avoid an, prescribing an opiate, which they're, they're literally doing in Canada with things like MAID. You know, they're providing euthanasia because they don't want to prescribe an opiate medication to a chronic pain patient. And it's like, you know, they're doing that for your protection, for your safety. And it's like, well, you're so concerned about my health 
that you won't allow me to have an opiate to control my pain with. But then you turn around and say that you'll help me die. I'm not ready to die. I don't want to die. And if you look at the other medications, they're causing death. But we're, we're talking about death from things like esophageal rupture. That's, that's where your esophagus rips open and bile and, and acid and stuff spill into your, into your body and, and start contaminating your, your organs and your guts. Um, you have things like renal failure, which is where your kidneys shut down from things like ibuprofen and aspirin. Um, Tylenol that attacks your liver in, in three different ways to where you end up literally shitting out your own liver. This, 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 that's actually a thing. You start shitting your own liver out from taking too much Tylenol. This is not putting someone, this is not someone in a state of euphoric bliss that's falling too far into their nods, going to sleep and not waking up. We should all be so lucky as to die that way. That's, that's what happens. It suppresses your respiratory and on opiates. When, when you overdose on opiates, it suppresses your respiratory system and you fall asleep and then you don't wake up. That's like the most ideal way to die. And one of the things that's being taken out away from the patient in this context is their choice and how they want to die. That was, that's been taken away. And that's a violation of bodily autonomy. That's a human right violation. Yeah. I'm okay with, you know, people not taking opiates for, for pain. What I'm not okay with is, is taking them away, away as an option. That's, that's a human right violation. It's a violation of bodily autonomy. And what a lot of full able-bodied people don't understand, and I know this because I used to be a full able-bodied person, you don't understand what the fuck you're talking about. I will be just as obsessed and crazy over getting a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory as I am a muscle relaxer, as I am an opiate. Because the, the bottom line is, is when you experience enough pain, just get the fucking pain under control, like yesterday, like six years ago. Get it under control. Because, uh, you know, sleeping four hours a night, four to six hours a night, is not fun. Waking up in the morning and throwing up stomach acid and blood just because they don't want you on an opiate pain medication is not fun. It's not acceptable. Taking four to six hours to make coffee, brush your teeth, and take a shower is a long time for something that should only take maybe an hour and a half to two hours. And that's something that opiate pain medications can provide to people that non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and muscle relaxers can't. On the pill cocktail I was on of 600 milligram ibuprofen, 10 milligram flexeril, 4 milligram tizanidine, plus the 2 milligrams of clonopin, as soon as those muscle relaxers wore off, which is about six hours, I wake up, still only six hours of sleep. Back when I took an opiate pain medication, actually, the pain medication I was on was tramadol. It's technically not an opiate. It's an it's opioid-like. Uh, molecularly, it's like that of an antidepressant, but it does block uh, pain receptors in the brain. So it's um, it's an analog. It's, it's man-made, so opioid. But the reason they say opioid like is because it's man-made, but it's not technically an opioid either. It's actually an antidepressant that just has some properties of blocking pain receptors, thus the title opioid-like. Only in recent years has it been called an opioid. But back when I was on that, even after it, because it lasts for eight hours, which is an amazing pain med, one pill, all you need, one pill, eight hours, pain relief, get through my day, get stuff done. And I go to sleep when I, when I went to sleep, sleep eight, nine hours like normal. Now that I'm off meds, it's like four hours a night. It's not fun. It's not fun. The other thing you don't understand is I would gladly give up the need for pain medication, whether that be opioids or non-steroidal anti-inflammatories or muscle relaxers. Can't take tricyclics. Can't take SSRIs. Can't take gabapentinoids. Uh, the SSRIs, tricyclics, are usually antidepressants. So gabapentinoids are antidepressants. Um, they swing me into mania and psychosis. Can't. Bad reaction. Bad reaction to those. Can't do steroids. Those land me in the hospital with a heart rate of only 40 beats per minute. Almost stopped my heart and killed me. Can't have this. The only options available that are left is non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, muscle relaxers, which I had to stop, lest I get in a hole in my stomach, renal failure, and esophageal rupture. I had to stop taking them. Um, because I don't prescribe opiate pain medications anymore, I have nothing to treat pain. Thanks. Really appreciate that. Thanks for... Um, Dictating how I uh, spend my life. Really appreciate that, society. Really appreciate you telling me uh, what you're going to do with my life. Really appreciate that. And you know what should have happened? They should have been working on something that was just as effective and worked and made sure of that. 
before they considered taking pain meds away. Because, right, they didn't have anything to fall back on. Nothing. So now chronic pain patients are playing guinea pig. And um, it's cost a lot of lives. And it's, it's left a lot of people paralyzed. And with worse conditions than they started off with. So, again, thanks for that. All the full able-bodied people that keep speaking on people who are debilitated by chronic pain behalf. You know, I, I can't think of a more ableist thing to fucking do, in my opinion. Um, you know, you, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't. I used to be fully able-bodied. Trust me, you don't know what you're talking about. And and by the time you become a chronic pain patient and you understand, you don't. You, you wish you didn't. Um, I, I would give up almost anything to have the function of the, this back. I, I, I would gladly give up. The, like, like being able, like being a chronic pain patient, um, and let, let's say that that's a legal excuse to take opiates. It's not an equal trade-off. It's not. Believe it or not, it is not an equal trade-off. It fucking isn't. There are a lot of things I can't do anymore, and it bothers the hell out of me. Things that able-bodied people take for granted for, things you don't even think about. You, you would never know you would miss it until it's gone. And once it's gone, all you can do is grieve over the loss. It's not worth it. It isn't worth it. Nope. Um, if anyone out there is trying to become a chronic pain patient because they think they'll get opiate medications, like even if they still prescribe them, I'd say that they're a fucking idiot. And they have no idea what they're talking about because they're not a chronic pain patient debilitated by chronic pain. And once it happens to them, they're going to find out, no, that's not worth it. It's not worth it. Okay, let me reiterate. It takes me four to six fucking hours to make coffee, brush my teeth, and take a shower. Shaving my face, that's a totally different story. Shaving my face takes two hours now. I have a patch of nerves here in my neck. Even the lightly touching it like that creates this fucked up sensation that goes into my chest, all over my neck, and into the side of my face, including my ear, kind of affects this area of just straight weird nerve pain. Like, it kind of feels like a sparkler going off in my neck, like fireworks going off in my neck, and stabbing sensations here around my clavicle, just lightly grazing it. Now imagine me taking a razor and going... This side of the face, no problem. That's quick, overdone quickly. This side of the face, that's the one where it's like... Uh, uh. And I'm right-handed, too. And I lack dexterity because of my condition. Yeah, there's a lot of things I miss. I would gladly, gladly, gladly forfeit the need for pain medication of any kind, regardless of what it is, to have my shit back the way that it, it's supposed to be. Gladly. And that's what full able-bodied people don't understand. You don't get it. And I would really appreciate it if you would stop speaking on our behalf. And, um, you know, I'd, I'd really appreciate it if you would stop comparing the desire for control and pain to that of somebody who suffers from opiate use disorder. It's not the same thing. You know, if you had a non-narcotic analgesic, fine. Bring it on. They don't exist, though. And actually, the reason why so many analogs exist, so many opioids, synthetic opiates exist, is because we've attempted to make an analgesic. An analgesic is defined as something that blocks pain receptors in the brain. It, it would appear, uh, we, we, we've attempted to create something that is an analgesic that doesn't create a sense of euphoria and a chemical dependency. It appears this cannot be done. You cannot slow down the central nervous system and block pain receptors without creating euphoria and chemical dependency. You can, it cannot be done. So looking at risks and benefits, which it even says on your pill labels that, you know, if you take this medication, you should discuss with your doctor the risks and the benefits. And the reason why your doctor has prescribed this to you is because they believe that the risks or the benefits outweigh the risks. Well, the side effects of opiates are constipation, chemical dependency, possibly addiction. Possibly. Remember, addiction has a different definition now. Not everyone does that. So like chemical dependency, yes, but that doesn't mean that you're going to be addicted. Unless you're, you know, if you compromise your life for it. Um... Constipation, addiction, chemical dependency, and respiratory suppression. Which, respiratory suppression usually doesn't occur unless taken too much. And then there's death. Well, the death doesn't occur unless taken too much. Or if you're giving, given an opioid that you have a severely bad reaction to. 99.9% um, .9 of the time, somebody overdoses on a pain medication. It's a chronic pain patient who has committed suicide because they're sick and tired of the pain. But you look at the risks and benefits of the other alternatives, like, okay, um, epidurals. Well, 
the benefits are like what a day or two of pain relief for two thousand dollars and the risk is well you could develop spinal arachnoiditis which will leave you in a wheelchair or dead or your heart could stop and die immediately you don't have to overdose it can just do that to you uh the risks for things like gabapentin malarica or tricyclic and is um Damage to the central nervous system, seizure disorders, muscular dystrophy, um, mania, psychosis, and death. Uh, the risks of Botox, which is botulism poisoning, um, well, it can kill you. It gets in your bloodstream, it can just kill you. But if they do it wrong, like the like like if they they gave me an injection here, it could cause all these muscles on this side of my face and in my neck to just go. <laughs> I would end up looking like a stroke victim. Successfully, you know, like when I had a, Bo I've had a Botox injection before. It cost me two thousand dollars, and it gave me four days of pain relief. That's it. And the risk is, it could have killed me, or it could have paralyzed the right side of my face. The risks of overuse of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and muscle relaxers is renal failure, esophageal rupture ulcers, liver failure, death. So why has an option for me, for my own bodily autonomy, been taken away? Um, and I'll, I'll have you know this too. I, I had to stop smoking weed because now they UA you. They give you a drug test. You can do this at your primary care physician. If you go to the ER, a hospital visit, pain management clinic, and if they find a metabolite that isn't supposed to be there, which include marijuana, CBD, and Kratom, they can deny you pain meds for the rest of your life. So if you're using, if you have like a mild pain condition or something and you're using marijuana to treat it, you better make damn sure that it works, that it really, really works. Because even in states where it's legal, if they find the metabolite, and it's not like you get another, like like something severe, really severe chronic pain condition or a pain condition or something like that. They not only can deny you pain meds for the rest of your life, they can discharge you. And they can deny you medical treatment altogether. In an ER setting, they will, instead of giving you intravenous opiates, they will give you intravenous Tylenol and ibuprofen. Yeah. In some cases, uh, there have been reports of chronic pain patients who've been given Haldol. And have ended up with like brain damage. Yeah, that this is a humanitarian issue. This is a human right violation. And ignoring bodily autonomy. So that, that's what I'm advocating for is chronic pain patients receiving an FDA-approved medication that is oftentimes much, much cheaper than the alternatives. You know how much a bottle of, of um, Lyrica costs without insurance? Found this out the hard way. I don't have insurance. It can cost $1,111. You know how much a bottle of Tramadol or Hydrocodone costs without insurance? <laughs> like 20 bucks. Yeah. Yeah. You do the math. Which is more profitable? Uh, not to mention, that Lyrica and Gabapentin um, produce one hell of a chemical dependency. I, I have a friend that can never stop taking Gabapentin for the rest of his life because uh, he's developed a seizure disorder. If he stops taking Gabapentin, he has uh, violent convulsions and seizures. So he has to take it for the rest of his life. That's one hell of a withdrawal. That, that medication can be for life if you start taking it. For the rest of your life, you will never be able to stop taking it. Yeah. Which gabapentin and Lyrica are the same thing. They're a gabapentinoid. And when originally manufactured, it was manufactured under the name Neurotin, which they had a class action lawsuit against Neurotin because of this seizure disorder. Now it's being manufactured under gabapentin and Lyrica, and we're having the same problem. Opiates don't do that. They don't create seizure disorders. They don't cause your kidneys to shut down. They don't destroy your liver. They don't eat holes in your stomach and cause esophageal ruptures. Yeah. Some things to think about as a fully able-bodied person. You, you, you really don't know what you're talking about. And you, you don't want to know. But you, you have to realize at some point, you don't know what it's like to be a chronic pain patient. So when I posted this post and somebody starts talking to me about people using drugs and overdosing on fentanyl poisoning because 
I'm talking about illicit drugs. I am not talking about illicit drugs. I'm talking about giving back the ability for chronic pain patients to receive an FDA-approved, controlled, and regulated narcotic medication. There's no fentanyl in it. Why are you talking to me about this? I am sorry for anyone who has lost someone because of fentanyl poisoning. Actually, my husband's sister had a girl down the street from her get some marijuana. It had fentanyl in it. She died. Now, um, I, don't, I don't think we're talking about pain meds. I think we're talking about an issue of street drugs having fentanyl in it. This has nothing to do with medications that are being prescribed, that could be prescribed. They've taken them away. They're not prescribed anymore. Um, they'll prescribe them, I believe, for acute pain, which is probably part of the problem of why people start turning to street drugs. If if that is, I think a lot of that, I think a lot of that is an excuse. But again, so you have people that engage in this vice, and then they become royally addicted, and then become mad about it because they act like they didn't know that was a thing. Maybe they truly didn't. I don't know, but I don't know how to not know that. So it makes it very, very difficult to try to advocate for chronic pain patients to get their opiate pain medications back. When people automatically jump to, well, I have all these friends that died from fentanyl poisoning because of drugs they brought off the street. I'm not talking about using street drugs. I, I, I would like to get pain meds from a doctor that had been prescribed by a doctor and get them from a pharmacy and made by a pharmaceutical company that is controlled and regulated by the FDA for health and safety purposes of the public. So um, when these people are talking about like, no, no, ban, ban, illegal, illegal, prohibition, this, prohibition, that, and they dare to call themselves a leftist, I have to ask, what kind of leftist are you? Are you authoritarian? Because that would make sense. Are you a Democrat? Because that would make sense. But you're not on my, my side of the left. You're not anti-authoritarian. You're not. So I guess I'm just too anti-authoritarian for these people. I'm too anti-authoritarian for the left. I'm Two anarchists for the anarchists, which is weird. Or whatever you want to call it, whatever the definition is these days. But yeah, something for you, boy, the body to think about and rack your brains around. And I'll try to leave the link to that article in the description. This video went on a lot longer than I thought. But anyway, um, like, share, subscribe, comment.